Welcome to episode 23 of the Petra Nerds podcast. Are you properly caffeinated, Trisha? I am properly caffeinated. Fantastic. It's Monday, July 26, 2021 in the afternoon. NYMAX crude is at 72 bucks, so I was a little wrong, about $10 <laughs> wrong. But August natural gas is up above 4 bucks, so I was directionally right, but too shy on the surge that we saw from... Uh, from AC demand and JKM's at fourteen thirty, which is pretty pretty solid. See, Today we're going to talk about directionally. What? That's where I want to go with the short directionally, uh-huh, as long as we're uh-huh. directionally right. I, I was waiting for a compliment on hey, congrats on getting at least fifty percent right, but um, the most I can get is you not disagreeing with me. So this week we're going to talk about OPEC and prices, IEA and the sustainable recovery tracker that they introduced. China, as usual, uh, the federal government's ongoing revision and potential contempt of court uh, regarding oil and gas lease leasing on federal lands. And we'll talk about improvements in the U.S. oil and gas landscape with positive OFS numbers and Shell sanctioning uh, a GOM project. So a lot to talk about. Let's start with OPEC and prices, where it all, all begins, Tricia. Yeah, you know, I just think that I think it's important to point out, like, I mean, you can Google, just Google oil and and go into, you know, what I do every, go into Financial Times and type in oil, go into Wall Street Journal and type in oil, go into Bloomberg.com and type in oil. And like last night, there wasn't a lot of news on, you know, oil prices and, and oil. Um, but last night was the, a slight slipping because of the Delta variant concerns. And I think that, you know, just recapping, because I don't think I had these numbers yesterday or last week when we recorded this when I was in Buffalo, Wyoming, was uh, OPEC is at 26 million barrels per day. So I think, um, you know, the... What you heard from Halliburton's earnings call, which we won't go through in this podcast, but we will with a recap with other uh, service providers, they're very bullish on the super cycle, the upcoming super cycle in oil prices, but they're also very bullish on U.S. activity um, and, you know, in, in increasing that. And, and I'm not sure the two perfectly go in tandem, but we're at 26 million barrels a day for OPEC. That's This is for June figures. So this is OPEC's numbers. And they have Saudi Arabia at 8.9 million barrels per day. So that's, I mean... We're at 9 million barrels. That, that, that gives them a, a million barrel a day plus wiggle room for Saudi Arabia. And we know that we talked last week about these allocations that have increased. I do think that um, the wiggle room given to uh, the wiggle room given on these increasing allocations and not so much that I think the Delta variant of, of this virus is, nece- is necessarily going to shut in, you know, uh, pockets of the economy, but I think there are fears about it. So I would, I would say in our short-term energy price outlook and our short-term oil price outlook that I would, I would bake in some, you know, high, you know, sixties and low seventies, because I think we're going to be moving around and it's going to bounce around whenever there's a concern about this Delta variant. And it does seem like I, I listened to Jen Paskey, the, or, you know, the, the white house, uh, um, speech woman, uh, and she was talking today about, uh, you know, they were asking a lot about the Delta variant and when the CDC was going to update things and if the CDC was going to update things and, you know, are they going to institute another mask mandate? And, you know, she was kind of dodging questions and saying we're going to leave it to, you know, the data and the science and everything. So I, I think that, um, you know, instituting new mask mandates, um, you know, I think New York has uh, is, is pushing for obviously pushing for vac- vaccinations. And somebody had asked about uh, forced uh it was healthcare being forced to take the vaccinations, healthcare workers being forced to take. So there's still a lot of questions about it. And I, I wouldn't rule out um, certain, at least the East Coast and West Coast, I wouldn't rule out some, you know, minor shutdowns. But I would say it, I'm not, I'm not overly concerned about it because it does seem like the data showing that, you know, it, we aren't seeing increased hospitalizations and we are not seeing um, increased deaths right now, but because a lot of folks are vaccinated. So it does seem to be transmitting easier, but it doesn't seem like anything's changing. So I, I just think the news and um, country, I wouldn't say all out shutdowns, but all the impacts as oil prices in the near term and, and certainly could impact the longer term growth story. I mean, I don't know if you saw the article on CNBC on um, oil prices, or sorry, not oil prices, on the housing market topping out that that new home sales had declined in in June, and that we are starting to see you know more homes on the market, and they think that we're at least you know a, a topping on sort of the housing side, and that means that if if the housing is topping and and the economy is sort of topping, that does mean that your growth story, at least the growth side, and I'm not saying all that oil demand, but the growth in oil demand might be topping as well. Right, and I I agree with everything you just said, but I would append to that that internationally things still don't look great 
And so yeah. with the rise of these new variants that it probably pushes the jet fuel recovery story out further. And that's the one leg of the refined product stool that we haven't really seen come back international jet fuel consumption. Yeah. And that's, you know, I was thinking about that last night as well, because that's what everyone keeps commenting on is that, you know, we don't have this international side, but I will point out that, you know, that what, same thing we, we've talked about, and we actually probably talk, we discussed, and I think the very first podcast is like, you know, how we change our behaviors because of this. And so in the US, everybody's driving more. I mean, everybody's going places. I can't, I haven't heard of anyone going on a modest little vacation and saying everything wasn't packed. You know, I was talking to someone in DC today and they're telling me that, you know, every nearby place is completely jam packed with locals and with tourists from the outside and people flying. It's a pain in the butt, like all this stuff. And, and we are nearing, um, I think we were, it was, it was too, it was the number on TSA throughput is, is very, very high. So we're, we're pre COVID, you know, we're, we're, we bounced back on local flying and that has helped demand considerably for jet fuel. So we were at, we're about one and a half million barrels a day of jet fuel demand. We're still, we're still shy 500,000 barrels a day. So of, of pre COVID jet fuel demand. So, and it's, it's a lot. And if you think globally, we still have jet fuel stockpiles. And that is a story that's not really well told when we're thinking about these rising oil prices. And we're thinking about everybody talking about in inventories reducing overall for, for oil, but we still have a big chunk of jet fuel demand. But we've offset it in, in many ways, like you know, oil demand in the US, we hit over 10 million barrels per day in that first week of July. And then we've since declined. We're at nine, I think it was last week, it was 9.3 million barrels per day for gas, sorry, for gasoline demand in the US. So we're driving more, we're doing all this stuff. And I think last week I told somebody, I went out to lunch in Denver on Friday and I was like, I cannot wait for, um, and I'm, this is very truthful, I cannot wait for unemployment benefits to be to be over and for people to start going back to work. Because I would like to be able to go to a restaurant in Denver for a work lunch and not have to wait an hour to a half an hour with a reservation to get seated um, because everybody is touristing and everybody has time off. And that's great for them, but I am I'm exhausted with... Um, the shortage of, of sa- it just want to go back to normal for working. You know, I having love your first world problems, Trisha. This these is, are real first, absolutely these are first world quality problems. These are first world, one hundred percent first world problems. But they're indicative of every single restaurant in Denver, every single restaurant everywhere is short staffed. Every come and go is short staffed. Nobody can get employees. So these, you know, the the people coming back to work is a real thing, and I think it will help. You know, the the pain you know sort of people are feeling on the pricing side for. For employment and everything. So I really, really, really think it's important for us to see what the economy and what oil demand looks like for that matter, you know, especially in the US when we sort of have the settling out of unemployment benefits and people going back to work and, and sort of a normalization of the economy. And, you know, it may look much more murky and messy in light of this Delta variant and where where states and individual places stand on on measures and what they're doing. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it was, it, oh, it's France. France that's having, um, I think that they've they had over 100,000 people g- get together and protest on, and I think they've had protests throughout the country because they're trying to institute the passport thing. And there's a lot of, if you listen to BBC, you can hear both sides of the story of, of folks that are, are in favor of doing this, this vaccine passport so they can open up and other folks who are not in favor of this vaccine passport because for a number of different reasons. So it's very, very messy. And I, I think all that, that sort of, there's no clear way to just, you know, open everything up. And the fact that you're having those protests in France are just indicative of, of this, this problem isn't going away anytime soon. Indeed. And uh, so a couple of things, I just want to go back. I am actually going to refer to the white house press or secretary secretary as the speech woman from now on. I think that's, yeah, sorry. That's, right. White no, house press, press secretary. I, I, I like that better. Speech, speech woman. That's great. Um, so well, let's, let's talk about what's going on with, with OPEC and global, global macro. But before you do that, with respect to those two issues that we talked about last podcast, which is um, the the employment benefits rolling off, uh, as well as the eviction moratorium, we have two really good natural experiments in econ that will tell us something. And I think your hypothesis seems to be that, you know, once those benefits roll off, people will have to be go back to work, so we'll get things filled out. The the other hypothesis that I haven't really heard anybody talk about is that it is indeed a function of wages not being high enough and that we might have to see wage inflation, in which case that would actually, in my view, in my view, be a bigger deal because wage inflation is what 
I think Jerome Powell is going to look for as inflation. So he's looking at employment numbers and then in, in wage inflation to talk about, you know, actually fulfilling that part of the mandate. So in terms of the broader market and, and loose economic policy, I'm looking for not just do people go back to work, but do, do wages start rising, which I think is important. And with respect to the housing market, you know, that's pretty interesting. I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of softening in prices, but certainly, you know, I'm, I'm short the housing market by not being long real estate. And I don't plan to, to be in that market. And hats off to anybody who, who wrote it up and, and made hay, but I, I'm not a buyer until things settle out for sure. Okay, so a couple things, and you you know you do a great job of keeping me on track. So so please please continue to do that. Cause Tiger I'm gonna, by the tail, Tricia. Um, so you know the the article on CNBC is how it quote housing boom is over as new sales fall to pandemic lows. So I think it's these new home sales. And look, I was I was studying at, you know getting my econ degree um, in two thousand was gra- I graduated in two thousand eight, and I remember seeing you know one of these you know, Fed papers and the on the housing starts and housing starts coming down. And I'm not saying it's a signal, but, you know, we do have extremely look at the 30 year, you know, 30 year on on how on mortgages and you'll see that it's below three percent. So something's happening when you start seeing new home sales fall. And I think that's it's not because mortgage rates alone are not going to incentivize somebody to buy a house. Clearly, you know, when housing prices go up, I, I looked at the value of houses in my neighborhood. It, it's got it's it's we're talking three hundred thousand dollars growth in in a in within a year and a half. Um, it, it's insanely high. Um, that aside for just a second, we do have wage inflation. So I am a big fan of an independent central bank. Um, I, I think we're starting to see, and I did was hearing this last night on Bloomberg too. I, I think for the first time we are starting to see um, you know, Jerome Powell and and um, Biden have been in lockstep, I think, for many things. Um, and we we do have a new Fed mandate, and we've talked about that before. But the Fed has only recently the Fed had two things that they they're supposed to do, and that is um, inflation and and unemployment. That's it. But recently, in light of COVID, the Fed had changed their mandate to say we're going to run hotter than two percent because we want a full and inclusive economy. So they they link that into the employment side, and they basically kind of broadened, you know, the the employment to be more full and inclusive. And it's it's hard to do that because they haven't put firm definitions around that. Now, I know that the numbers, uh, we had Biden's mentioning inflation, I think last week with regards to, because there was a poll that came out and um, it didn't look so great for Biden of that, you know, if, if folks are feeling inflation. So I think he's not as um, happy you know, about inflation. He's not going to be as happy about inflation as he maybe once was because the fee- folks at the bottom and and middle class are actually feeling it. And you can see it. I mean, you can see it when you're filling up the pump. You can certainly see it at the grocery store and you can see this. So I would argue that we already, we definitely do have wage inflation. You can't have um, bonuses at come and goes and, you know, and all these places. You can't have bonuses at gas stations and bonuses at restaurants of $1,000 and at McDonald's of these bonuses and, you know, $15 an hour. Most of these places are all paying more than Amazon. You know, Amazon is paying like $12 an hour with all these, you know, perks and stuff on top. So almost all these places are paying well above, um, are paying well above minimum wage with bonuses right now. That is wage inflation. And the restaurants are having, are, you know, if you're going out, if you're trying to go out to dinner and you're seeing the, the hour long waits and everything, this is just because this is a first world problem, but it's because of the pent up demand, everybody's going out and they're traveling and they're trying to go out to eat. And these restaurants are having trouble keeping people staffed um, in light of, and they have all this this pent up demand as well. But that's that's wage inflation, um, and that's something that Jerome Powell may not want to admit, and they're struggling with. But you have to have to realize that they have the massive amount of money that we have sloshed around the system. You know, we're still buying the fact that you know they have they've begun talking about tapering, but the fact that they're still committed to buying mortgage backed securities. Look. Unless this, the more the housing market's going gangbusters. So the fact that we have even the Fed has continued to buy mortgage backed securities over the past several months is ludicrous. Um, it's absolutely ridiculous. I think the you know the benefits for you know you mentioned the benefits for evictions. I mean, if that's real, people really need that. I mean, if that's if and I'm sure in in certain income brackets, that's a real thing of people getting evicted. Then obviously that should be maintained. But I think the unemployment benefits. What we're seeing is there's a dislocation in many you know unemployment benefits. And I wonder we did have a spike, a little bit of a rise in unemployment. And I wonder if uh, part of that is if. It, what sector? I want to know what sectors of the economy was that what what peaked up, or is it you know that um, 
you're getting roughly what um, twenty two dollars an hour effectively on, for, with unemployment benefits. So that is hard. That's what you're competing with on this fifteen dollars an hour plus the the bonus. And when that all sort of washes out, but also you have to have people. You have to have kids going back to school, and um, that is where this Delta variant comes back into play. Is that you know if and we don't have um, I think. Jen Paskey was asked about whether when the FDA was going to approve one was going to make the the vaccination not because um, it's under emergency authorization right now. Right. The vaccination. So they the question was, when is it not going to be under emergency authorization and when are children going to be able to get it um, or basically it, it being expanded to children? And so the FDA hasn't done that yet. And so I think that's, you know, unless and I, I think a lot of folks are might be hesitant to have their children get the vaccine when, you know, they're at low risk um, or supposedly low risk and when it's not it's under emergency authorization. And that means that, you know, if the Delta variant is rampant in or the virus is rampant in the fall and winter, that you could see schools close. And then that means that people, parents are going to have to stay home. And that all has a, you know, compounding trickle effect into the economy and also into oil demand and oil prices. So that's not going away anytime soon. Um, And I think the fall will be the fall will be tricky and a little messy as it plays out. Um, And this housing thing, this could be that housing thing could be a month monthly blip as well. You know, this could yeah, you you pop might back see up. me protesting in the streets of Greenwood Village, Colorado, if uh, if they close schools again. Let's oh yeah, your poison. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That'll... Let's let's hope that doesn't happen. All right, finally, OPEC. Let's go to OPEC. Okay, so yeah, I mean, not not a whole lot. I mean, there's not a ton a ton there. We talked about it mostly last week, and I, I threw out that number of of twenty six that the OPEC July report is 26 million barrels a day of production. That's according to the secondary sources. And you have 8.9 million barrels per day for Saudi Arabia. You've got, um, it is important to point out, I mean, Libya, who is excluded from production, is at one, you know, almost 1.2 million barrels per day. They're eking up a smidgen. You've got Nigeria also excluded, which is at 1.4 million barrels per day. Um, UAE at, um, at uh, almost 2.7 million barrels per day of production. Venezuela has actually edged up as well from not a ton. They were at 481,000 barrels a day in April. They're at 529,000 barrels a day in June. But we did mention last week in the last podcast, I mean, 100,000 barrels a day here, 100,000 barrels a day there, times 100,000 barrels a day by 10, and you have a million barrels a day. And I don't think that U.S. production is going to stay flat at 11 million barrels per day for very long. I think it's we're going to see we're going to see production start eking up. And we are seeing, I mean, you've seen the, I don't know if primary vision has a fractal count well over 240. Um, I think we're, we're seeing those numbers edge higher. We're seeing the rig count edge higher. And we're seeing a, um, Halliburton did mention in the earnings call that disproportionate, you know, or at least I think somebody questioned that disproportionate number of private companies, you know, increasing on the, on the, you know, rig count and service side. And I think that, and Halliburton and other companies mentioned in their, in their previous earnings call that we're going to have a counter cyclically, um, a counter cyclically, uh, winter. So we're going to, we're going to have higher activity over the course of the fourth quarter, third and fourth quarter than we normally do when people, folks taper off. And I agree with that. I think we are definitely teeing ourselves up for that. So what that means is that I think the U S is going to push through, um, the fall and winter and, and continue, you know, lean in onto higher oil prices and continue to um, continue to produce. I also think, and something the folks have mentioned in the context of OPEC, is that OPEC keeps prices high through the first quarter of next year, and then operators re- really begin to hedge that, and that, you know, those those folks are protected. And I do think, you know, if, if we have these concerns about the Delta variant and everything and prices stay at these levels, we should start seeing, um, we should start seeing much more hedging, especially in the $70 range. Okay, so... Just to be clear, though, your 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 non weekly, quarterly forecast would be for a range of sixty five to seventy five. That's what you said last week. Does that does that still make sense? Does that still it stand? still does? And that's a really that's that's like giving me a huge gift. I mean, the fact that anyone would give me any kind of credit for a ten dollar range is is like BS. I mean, ten dollar range is pretty wide. You could give me credit for you know within a monthly window if I have it within a five buck range or even a three buck range, but. That's a really wide 65 to 75 is pretty wide. But I think given the way traders are have been moving oil when we talked and it was we were talking in, last week and it was 67 and now it's it's 72. So obviously we're within that band. But that five dollars up, five dollars down, those that is traders that is not fundamentals. And, you know, the short could be short covering. It's a number of different factors. But I don't I think that the, um you know, the fundamentals and 
it's important to watch when we're talking about OPEC and just keep this in your back of your mind for everything. It's important to watch the numbers each month of the production that's added with OPEC and understanding demand growth. We we have had this backdrop of rising demand in light of, of not having, you know, jet fuel recover, not having international travel. So you're going to have that. I think that demand growth I'm just going to caution folks to realize that I'm not saying demand's declining by any means, but it's the growth. You know, pre-COVID, we were very concerned about demand growth, the trajectory of the growth. Um, not that we were going to, you know, drop off a cliff from 100 million barrels a day of demand, but I think it's important to put this in context because I think traders could freak out if they don't see this, you know, month over month increase in demand growth. And we may sort of, as folks, you know, as things normalize a bit, we may sort of lose some of that steam and momentum um, just because you don't have the flexibility to drive everywhere. Okay. Do you want to move on to China or do you want to talk about the IEA's new sustainable recovery tracker? Well, we can, we're, those are going to fold in and together pretty well. So we've had a lot of weather events lately um, and I'm not going to get, you know, I'm not going to sit up on a soapbox and tell you whether that that's climate change or not. I, I mean, we have a lot of increased weather events and I think that the BBC has done, you know, every time there's an extreme weather event, they pinpoint the person that's on, on the, on the show that they're interviewing. And they say, now is that, that can't, can't you say this is definitely from climate change? And actually some of them have a hard time saying 100% sure it's from climate change, but that's basically what the talk is, right? We had flooding in China. We had fl massive flooding in China. We've had, you know, flooding in, uh, we've had flooding in Germany. I mean, we had, we've had a really, really hot summer and obviously in, um, in the U S and, I just think it's interesting in light of the IEA sustainability report, they talk about, um, and, you know, we've talked about the IEA a lot on this podcast, and we've talked about their previous reports that they've had. Um, you know, they do a monthly report that comes out that we all follow for, you know, mobility indices, and we all follow for, um, you know, inventories and everything. And then they did that big report where they basically told everyone no investing in fossil fuels, uh, no more investing in fossil fuels if we want to hit net zero by 2050. But they said that was a thought piece. And then since then, Fatih Barol, the head of the International Energy Agency, has since then said it's his, you know, one of his best works, one of their best works. And actually, I just heard the guy, the president of the COP26, who was the one who pushed that report, the UK um, president of the COP26, um, he was just on, he was just on BBC as well, talking about this, the COP26 meeting that's going to be in, you know, that they're going to have in November. And he was just talking about, you know, the need to really push on the coal angle and, and, and where China is on this. So back to this, the actual report, this little mention is that the IEA basically said that, you know, the Build Back Greener, Build Back Better, all this stuff folks are talking about is that, you know, they are 35 million or $35 billion has been, um, is that right? Hold on one second. Let me get that number. They said 35% of the amount envisaged by the IEA sustainable recovery plan to put the world on track for net zero emissions by 2050. That's what we've seen so far. And so the spending is woefully behind what they need to get us there and that they expect emissions to, to rise to new record levels by 2023. Yes. Yeah, so it's all, it's the, this is, they say, quote, this government spending and new policies put in place since last year are expected to add an extra 350 billion U.S. dollars to clean energy and electricity network spending between 2021 and 2023. This represents an increase of 30% over the level seen in recent years. Yet, this is only 35% of the amount envisioned by the IEA Sustainable Recovery Plan to put the world on track for net zero emissions by 2050 while boosting global economic growth and creating millions of new jobs. So they basically, this, this sustainable reco recovery tracker is basically saying we're shy, you know, we're going to be having to spend roughly a trillion dollars a year um, to get to this. And the reason I think this is important is because I sent Ethan this video on... Um, there was a green, it was, is Bloomberg's green. And they had this 20 minute video that just came out and I, I was watching it and they were talking about, you know, a lot of it was on actually the U S and the, the ebb and flow of politics in the U S and, you know, uh, Obama saying no to the Keystone XL, Trump saying yes to Keystone XL, Keystone XL not getting built despite that. And then, uh, Biden axing Keystone XL, you know, TransCanada losing out on $4 billion just from the permitting side. And I think somebody commented, the, the young woman that was on that commented, you know, the industry is, is not fairly representing that these jobs, they were talking about the jobs for Keystone XL. And she said something like, the industry is not fairly saying that these are short-term jobs. This is just, you know, building of the pipeline. And I thought, 
yeah, I mean, that's that's every job, right? That's the infrastructure plan for under Biden is that and I'm not saying those are those are bad jobs, even in the infrastructure plan, but they're short term. You don't keep when you build a road, once it's done, it's over, folks. And the same thing goes for when you install the windmill. It's it's over. The the windmill's installed. And when you install the solar panel, the windmill's installed. It, it doesn't matter if it's green or if it's if it's foster related. It's those are short term. The jobs are different, though, in in you know, we're decreasing the amount of people in the field for oil and gas. But the reality is, is that I call a lot of BS on comments like that because the green jobs that folks talk about, that in every BBC, every, everything, they talk about the green jobs and, and how we can go green and it'll be just fine for the economy. Those are short-term jobs and um, they are very much on underpinned by basically solar and wind insulation. Oh, and there was an article on wind on offshore wind, I think in the Wall Street Journal that was talking about, um, it, Wall Street Journal Financial Times is talking about the decline in prices of basically the margins are really declining. I mean, I think Siemens um, has basically said that, has warned for the last several quarters that the margins on their offshore, on offshore wind turbines are are narrowing. Um, and yet we have companies like, and I can't wait for the BP earnings call because that'll be very interesting, but we have all these companies leaning so heavily into offshore wind, um, basically to hit these, obviously their targets and, and to hopefully gain favor with investors. And yet we're not really actually seeing that um, that favor with investors yet. So I do think they're, these, these big oil companies are between a rock and a hard spot. And that's something that the IEA sustainability tracker, you know, I, I, we need to go through it in detail, but I'm not sure it's taking into account how, how difficult it's going to be for some of these, you know, these larger oil companies to actually do this. Um, and the scope three emissions, I, I, that was also mentioned in that uh, Bloomberg Green clip um, that they, they did list out all the oil companies, including Occidental, that has a target for the scope three emissions. And, you know, that scope three emissions is your end user emissions. And I think that's a that's very hard and fascinating that companies, you know, it really it's not a benefit to the oil and gas industry to it's going to be very hard for them to actually rein that in or focus on. And I think it's it, it, it's I wouldn't say it's useless, but it's um, it's very, very impractical for you know, them to be focusing on uh, the and, and oil company is producing the energy to be focusing on end user emissions. And if we're going to do that, I think we should be asking solar and wind companies to be focusing on upstream emissions and giving us a full account of, of the life cycle of those emissions on how they create uh, that product. Well, that supply chain is certainly coming to fruition. I don't know if you saw, but uh, Fidelity also announced that they'd be basically calling to account all the executives of, I think, a top thousand companies that they invest in for um, board uh, targets for emissions and a climate change plan. So some of the big investors are definitely definitely making moves, and we'll, we'll keep our eye on that. Um, with respect to the U.S. political situation, Deb Holland is starting to get some pushback on not following through with the court order. And the oil and gas industry uh, bar is starting to say, well, at what point are they in contempt of court for not revising the federal lease ban? What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, this was this. So there was a, a you know, a review and outlook sort of an, an, from the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal on Deb Holland's oil and gas stall. And I think that, you know, we, we've talked about this in previous podcasts and we haven't updated folks because there really isn't an update from, you know, the Bureau of Land Management or the Department of Interior on where this is going. Um, but, you know, this this pause in this leasing was put in place under, for, our, you know, the Climate Change Executive Order 140008. Um, and that's what they've sort of, they basically, the Department of Interior said this pause. Now that was basically that judge, I think it was, Quote, the review still isn't done and the interior still hasn't announced leasing sales despite federal judge Terry Terry uh, Dottie's ruling that the pause violated law. So basically, they had a judge ruling that this actually did violate law and they were supposed to basically legally go through these lease sales. And they're saying that they'll be done and they keep saying uh, early summer. Well, it's the end of July. So uh, the, the industry is basically saying that early summer is over. And um, North Dakota is saying, according to this article, that they've lost, you know, 80 million in revenue um, from the interior's cancellation of the March and June leasing auctions, um, which they think could grow billions of dollars. But the, the reality is, is that those are two. So legally, we were supposed to have two leasing rounds. And I, I the expectation is that in the coming months, they'll come out and they'll 
allow for lease sales, but they're going to massively increase the um, the royalty rate, which is at 12 and a half percent. So they're going to massively increase the royalty rate and they're going to put a lot of stipulations on that. And so the the expectation is that you're going to have, um, you're just not going to have the same bidding um, and you're going to, the the the, the reason they're, they're doing this is to intentionally limit um, and effectively try to, I mean, they can say that they're not, but they want to effectively try to ban oil and gas leasing um, on federal land. So they can say it's to increase revenue, but that's not what's going to happen. And that's not what they want because they're very clear about they, you know, don't want increase oil and gas development. Um, but that's, uh, that's a reality. And obviously that goes in, you know, there has been, it does go in counter, you know, that we've talked about the hypocrisy of the Biden administration on energy globally, um, and domestically. And that's, you know, that's absolutely one of them because, you know, they're okay with Nord Stream too. It looks like that's going to go ahead. So, um, yeah, that's step home. We, I, I'm sure there'll be an update in the coming. Hopefully, there'll be an update in the coming weeks, and we actually hear something. But if you pull up on on Secretary, there's there's nothing to be seen as in terms of an update on that topic. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty fascinating. I wonder how how long the judge will let them slow roll that. that uh, well, you know, it is interesting. I mean, that's that. So it's kind of like. Um, I don't know when you see things that are it's, it's deemed illegal, but unless you actually enforce it, you know, what does it matter? Um, and so I don't know how this is going to be enforced. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure people would say this about the previous administration, but this administration has certainly had things that folks are, don't think is completely illegal or kosher that they've pushed through. Um, and so we'll see where this actually goes. And I think you'll have to have increased court battles and you'll have to have pressure on this to actually have it rise to a level. And basically I think they're, they're, you know, slow walk this, they're trying to just kick this out a little bit further. Um, cause this is all based on a, on a big report that's going to set the tone for everything that they're going to do. So I don't think, I don't think this is limited to just the federal oil and gas leasing. I think there's a bunch of stuff that's part of that climate change executive order that took a lot of, you know, studies and things into account and they're not finished with that um and so if this becomes something bigger if it if it's you know they bring a bunch of stuff out it, it could be an interesting time when they release their uh, their actual conclusions of their studies right so we we actually ran through our list pretty quick i i feel like this is the quickest we've ever gone through our full I'm agenda not done. I'm not oh, done. I know. Well, we, we knew that was the case. So yes. I was going to ask you what's next on your list. Um, well, OK, so there's two two things. And that is that, you know, I, you know, in light of this and this just made me think of it because um, I sent you this article on Norway's prime minister, um, basically Erna, Erna Solberg of Oslo, basically saying that she remains committed to oil and gas. And I think Norway is a really interesting country because obviously, you know, stat oil now now Equinor, formerly named stat oil is there is there oil champion. Um, and, you know, this is a very outspoken country on, on, you know, on climate change and on, on, you know, science and everything. And I've, uh, you know, my previous job, I was, I was very fortunate to, you know, spend time with the Norwegian and the ambassador's residence of, of Norway in DC. And, and we had, we had embassy events and we, we, I spoke at the Norwegian ambassador's house. And I remember my, my former boss, Lou Polarisi asking a question, you know, when I was speaking there and he asked the, the, um, ambassador at the time, he asked him, you know, how is it that Norway is able to, um, you know, produce oil and gas effectively, do it safely? Because this is, you know, not far after we had the big, you know, BP oil spill. And there was a lot of talk about how their safety standards um, abroad, especially in Norway, were so good. And he asked, like, how can you, you know, you, you know, you can produce oil and gas and yet, you you know, you can, you can rain, you know, can talk about climate change and you can do, you can do both. And how is it that the the country and the people sort of accept that. And I, I thought about that because this article is about Norway's prime minister basically saying that they're, they're going to keep, they're going to continue producing oil and gas. And um, the ambassador's answer, I believe it was that essentially, you know, they live off the sea, you know, Norwegians live from the water, both from, from fishing, um, but oil and gas is sort of the lifeblood. And I think it's not, it's not counter intuitive for them to continue to use that. And I think the reality is also that they know it's a part of it. So it's a part of, you know, these, these entities are, you know, like the I increasingly the IEA, but others are, are really asking these countries and, and, you know, these, um, and the clips from this Bloomberg green are basically, you know, asking companies themselves, you know, oil companies to reduce their, you know, to reduce their output, to force folks to, um, to be reducing demand. And the reality is that, you know, we've been talking about demand. Demand isn't going anywhere, even in light of all this pressure, we've seen demand actually increase. And so, you know, these countries, this is, 
they produce this. So I, and, and she's up for, obviously they're having elections and everything. So it's a relative, or it's a, you know, it's relevant um, in this context that basically, you know, folks want to get reelected. And I think that's something that Biden's dealing with as well on this inflation side and on, you know, what this means is that they may want to push through all the green stuff in the world. But I mean, Excel Energy announced in the Denver, Excel Energy announced that they're in Denver, that they're going to try to increase rates by 13%. That is pretty damn high, you know, 13% increase on your electricity bill. That's not, and you know what I, frustrates me is that they've been saying over and over, they've been saying, it's just a little bit, a little bit here and there, a little bit here and there, you know, 13% is not a little bit, it's a lot bit and I'll feel it. And I sure as hell know that folks that make a lot less than me are going to feel it as well. And I'm not, a, I'm not okay with that, you know, and that's not because we don't have cheap natural gas, which again, it's over $4. So it's not quite as cheap, but that's because they're paying for, you know, those those rate increases are paying for you know the the cost of those renewables being added and and great if you love them but there is a cost to them and also paying for the depreciation of those coal assets it is not excel who pays for the depreciation of those coal assets it is us the consumer so you know we as the consumer don't get to decide how much renewables are in the in the pool how much gas is in the pool but we as the consumer have to pay when they decide to depreciate those assets because they have political pressure and that is just not how it should work. You know, um, I, I think it's it. We'll see how that goes down. And I remember asking and I, I have a lot of respect for Alice Jackson with with Excel here in Denver. But I remember asking her at a public event a couple of years ago at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science about the rate increases. And I believe her response was, you know, we don't like to call them rate increases. And that really did make me uncomfortable of I, that may be what you don't like to call them rate increases as a company, but that's what they are to the consumer is there. It's a rate increase. And I think she, she understands these issues really well. She's an extremely intelligent woman. I have an immense amount of respect for her, but at the end of the day, how much the consumer pays for electricity is very, very relevant um, and will in, continue to be relevant. Well, I, yeah. And I think we should acknowledge that utilities aren't just companies. They're regulated monopoly service providers that are intensely political organizations. And so you wouldn't last long as the CEO of a company that serves uh, blue states by saying, no, we're going to slow roll renewables because we think keeping rates lower is more important than, than creating a big wedge of, uh, of fuels that only have a 10 to 30% capacity factor. Right. Well, it's just, you know, I, I just think it's 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 important in the context of thinking about, you know, they're saying they want this 20, this 13 percent increase in, in rates. You know, I remember someone right after the storm coming by my house and asking about solar insulation. And the reason is was Excel was trying to put solar on the houses to help offset that big spike, you know, in, in gas prices that happened over that uh, over the February storm surge. You know, and so it was ways for them to help offset that. Personally, I would rather pay just the 200 bucks up front and then decide if I, you know, whatever the cost is to me and then decide if I want solar. But the reality is, is it's, you know, it, it, it's a it's a tricky business, but, you know, they have capped natural gas use at like, I believe it's 20 percent. So they could increase natural gas into the, you know, they could increase the use of natural gas, but they don't want that. They, you know, the story is they don't want the legacy assets, fossil fuel assets on their books that they will have to depreciate. Well, I'm already paying for the depreciation of the coal assets. So why don't you let me get the the cost benefit now of increasing the natural gas usage? You're going to bill me later anyway um, for the depreciation of it. So, I mean, I'm, I, th I think the consumer is ultimately paying for it. So um, it, I think if the consumer has to speak about it, the consumer may want a little more natural gas in their electricity pool. Okay. That's what else is on your list? <laughs> um, yeah. So, anyways, that was that the the thing for Norway. I, I'll loop back and just say, I mean, the International Energy Agency has basically called on them to base to reduce their output and to be, you know, take a more proactive measure. And they're not obviously buying into this. The last thing on my list that I want, I do want to loop back to, and I've talked about this, and I brought the book so you can see it because in this uh, China, this is the book China Goes Green um, by um, if. I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Um, it's Y-I-F-E-I -E Lee and Judith Shapiro. And it's called China Goes Green. I highly recommend this book to everyone. Um, it's, an, it's a very, very good read. Judith Shapiro was actually, the reason I bring this up is because she was interviewed on, on BBC when they're talking about this, the China flooding um, and everything that was happening within, within China as of late with all the, the rain that they've had, an intense amount of rainfall in a very, you know, I think it was something I heard in the same 
podcast I heard within three minutes that it was a it, it was the same amount of rain that they experienced in a year or over three years, basically in one day. So I don't know if it was one year or three years equivalent, but it was a lot of rain um, and caused obviously, you know, there was a lot of loss of life. Folks have been trapped in subways and it's very, very sad and very devastating. Um, but she was just talking about it in context of they were asking her because they were linking, you know, obviously asking about climate change. And I know last week when they were talk when they were interviewing folks on BBC um, in Germany about the stuff that was happening happening in Germany, they did question some of the politicians and said, you know, do you really want to talk? You Do, do you really want to link this back to because they have a, an election obviously happening in Germany because uh, Angela Merkel is on her way out and they'll have, you know, we'll have to find they'll have to have a new leader. And so the politicians were basically saying, you know, this is about climate change. And even the guy in BBC was asking the interviewers basically saying, hey, do you really want to link it back because people are losing their lives and they may not be want to talk about climate change right now. They may want to, you may want to table that. And the same thing was kind of interesting in China because they were asking Judith Shapiro about, you know, how, um, you know, is China committed to climate change and, and moving the needle on this? And, you know, she basically said what she says in the book is that, you know, they have very coercive um, environmental programs. And she was, you know, even illuminated past, past the book talks about like, forced recycling, but she was, she was just talking about how it's inter, you know, these coercive measures are interlinked with their big brother sort of state. And she was saying that, you know, I, you've probably heard about the experimental, um, moral, like it's like a, it's like a, not a moral credit. It's like a credit system on, on good behavior and stuff that they're experimenting with in China. Well, this is linked to, so when you bring in your recycling in some places, they actually go through your recycling and look at it. And then that's linked to your sort of credit on this, on you know, your good behavior credit or whatever. And that can impact these, these folks from getting jobs in the future, from getting school, you know, um, all these things, like even getting, renting how, you know, renting and everything like as really significant big brother implications. This is not little stuff, but this, you know, comes back into literally like, what did you recycle? You know, and in the book, they talk about like having cameras actually on your trash cans and, you know, limited times in which you can actually throw things away and impacts people who have depend, you know, regular jobs who don't, can't throw, you know, can't get home in time enough to throw this stuff away. And it really talks about just this top down um, environmental pressure. And the, the reason I pointed out is because that I, I, I was, I watched uh, Loki last night, the a- last episode, and, and I won't give it away uh, on Disney of the of the ending. No but spoilers. But they were no spoilers. But there was a they were they're throwing out voices, um, and one of them was Greta Thunberg, um, a, a quote from like Greta Thunberg, and they threw out, and I thought, wow, this this young woman has made it all the way to a Marvel, you know, Disney on on Disney of of one of the quotes, and I just thought. The significance of that is that, you know, she isn't a scientist. She's a young woman and she's an advocate, you know, and um, and yet that's it, it's become this this huge prominent thing. And the reality is these things are are deeply interwoven and they have really systemic consequences. And so, you know, we can say all day long that, you know, we need to do all these measures to, to impact um, impact climate and reduce reduce the temperature and everything. But, you know, China whether or not they're committed to it is is a really, really serious thing. And they say they are. They say they're doing this. But the reality is what you see on the ground is they're not. And, you know, Carbon Tracker is a great website if you actually want to see the maps of of the actual coal-fired power plants, both the coal mines in construction permitted and new coal mines, as well as existing ones in China, as well as the coal-fired power plants, the ones in use, the ones in constructions and the one it permitted. People throw this out all the time. You can check it out on a carbon tracker. You can actually see it. So the reality is they're not changing anything. But what's also really interesting is that, you know, hydropower, and this is why I link this back to the flooding and everything. It's not that I'm not discount. I mean, it's, the rains are severe and it's extremely sad. But when, when folks were being interviewed on a number of these podcasts, they were saying, you know, last year, this year, it, it was really about the rain. But last year they were saying, you know, there was some linking to dams, not um, dams not working. And, you know, China has a, a massive, they do have a good chunk of renewables. You know, they have about 67% coal or I'm sorry, 65% coal, according to 2019 level, uh, 2019 numbers. Um, and they have a huge amount, you know, their, their shape of the pie for power use is about 65% coal. Now renewables are a good chunk of that as well. I mean, we're, but the biggest portion of their renewables is not actually solar and wind. It's actually hydropower. And that counts for about 17% of their 
um, energy consumption. So 17% is hydroelectric power. Now that requires a lot of dam building um, and uh, lots of things upstream and downstream of that hydroelectric power. Now they're able to do that because they have a authoritarian regime that basically just, they don't have, you know, the same rule of law that we do. And they, they can just go into a parcel of land, they can remove people and they can just build it. And this book, China Goes Green, does a really good job of talking about, and they don't directly, but they allude to basically a lot of this stuff happening within Tibet and Xinjiang, and that basically it's easier to remove people from their homes and then just build this. But the reality is there are serious systemic um, environmental implications for this for hydroelectric power and for dam building because you change the ecosystems upstream and you change the ecosystems downstream and you can create a lot of drought, uh, a lot of droughts um, and stuff and, and the whole ecosystem it, from the damming where the areas are not getting um, their natural accumulation of water. Furthermore, China does not have the, um, the, you know, systems in place and the security that measures and checks and balances um, and the enforcement of efficiency of how you build things. So sometimes these dams can fail um, and sometimes these systems can fail and they just don't work. And then we have all these repercussions for it. So it's very, very real. And then lastly is that, you know, we just have less and less transparency in China. So we don't actually know how well these things are working or how, you know, how accurate this data is. And, you know, I, I found reports that basically from 10 years ago that said the goal was to hit 65%, you know, coal, the number was to hit 65% coal and, and, and magically they're at 65% coal. So, I mean, whether or not they're actually at 65% coal is almost irrelevant because we know that Chinese data is not very valuable. And yet whenever we, you hear talks from the IEA and you hear all this talk about climate change, all it's always referenced. Cop, the guy from COP26 today um, on BBC from, from the UK was referencing, you know, China and their commitments to climate change. And I just think it's increasingly important that, you know, China may say they're committed, but I, I truly do not believe they're committed to actually implementing this stuff because it's much, much harder to do that on the ground. Well, we agree there because I think China's taking us for a ride. I think they're going to go on doing exactly what they're going to do and what's in their interest, carbon or no carbon. And that may involve renewables and certainly hydroelectric power is a great power source. And they're probably in a better position to take advantage of those opportunities than we are because it's a lot harder. I don't see us displacing any citizens like we did with the construction of the Tennessee Valley Authority in the in the 30s and, in, and during World War II to add on any new hydroelectric power. That's that's not going to happen. If anything, we'll be taking dams down. So the Chinese are probably in a better position to to build new dams as you as you saw them do with the Well and, and hydroelectric power is about you we see in the, you know, there's small dams and small, you know, dams in the northeast that could probably be used for greater hydroelectric power in the US. I'm not not uh, you know, we've said this a number of times, I'm not poo-pooing hydroelectric power or, or you know, wind or solar for that matter, but it's just that it is a huge, when you break up the Chinese pie, you have to see how much is hydroelectric power. And you have to realize that, you know, these mandated things have systemic implications and, and China is not a transparent country. So if there are massive ramifications as a result of this, you're not going to hear about it. Um, you mean and you, they're gonna- you don't believe their their 4,000 COVID dead number? Uh, no, I do not believe that that number. <laughs> um, and I mean, I just think it's 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 increasingly irrelevant. And actually, you know, the reason I li- I'll link this back all the way to because our our um, deputy secretary of state, I believe, was um, and I'm blanking on her name, um, not Blinken, um, but her uh, underling was in China last um, last night. And so, if you saw the news feed that was coming out of that, it wasn't it wasn't super positive um, from what China was saying and what the U.S. was saying. But they keep saying. The U.S. keeps saying, and 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 Paskey said it today in her, you know, the speaker woman. Speech um, woman. Speech woman. You know, what she said today was, hey, she echoed the same thing that, that John Kerry says and others is that, okay, we'll agree on things where we can. Climate change is one of them and would like to move forward on climate change. And to me, it's very counterproductive. You know, we're dealing with a very increasingly aggressive China uh, on a much, on a level most folks really prob- probably don't understand on how on how deep this goes with China and how how messy it really is, and the fact that we're saying we can we can work on climate change stuff together, we cannot. You know, you you can't say no. You know, you're you're you know you have modern day genocide with these Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, but we'll work with you on climate change when in fact you're producing the solar panels and you're using coal fired power generation in Xinjiang and you're taking those people and you're actually exporting to other parts of the country and that's how you're keeping labor prices you know labor prices low. It it, it doesn't actually work together and so. 
just the fact that we keep saying out loud, this country keeps saying out loud that we can work with them on climate change. You can say that and, and, and we can, you know, spend all the money and work on climate change, but, and China can tell you that they're going to work on it, but it's not compatible, you know, unless it's compatible, if it makes economic sense for them, you know, domestically, and it, then they'll do it. Um, if it doesn't, they won't. And right now they're producing a lot of those solar panels and producing a lot of those windmills to export them, not necessarily to use them. And by, by sheer volume and the numbers, because they're such a big country, they do have an absolute you know, high number of wind you know, and solar, you know, but they also are building to hit peak load, just like you know, they did with coal. You know, they have to have that a mass amount because they can't actually have big, big power outages without people getting pissed off. Well, uh, although we're in danger of becoming a China podcast instead of an oil podcast, I think those two are definitely intertwined and, and likely to remain the subject of, of our discussions until we hit episode 100, which will be fun. I think they'll continue. Yeah, episode 100 will be super fun. And I, I, I mean, China is highly relevant to, you know, to global oil demand. And we can end on this note. I mean, I think they're the talks of they're getting hammered in the market right now because China um, had is sma smashing and, and clamping down on um, a after after school tutoring. So their market is taking, you know, those stocks are taking a bath. Um, but the same goes for any time they want to do anything. And I know on their teapot refineries, there's talk of, of increased regulation. And so folks are worried about the import figures that we're going to see for China. And I think part of this could be, you know, we do have to watch it in talking about these forecasts for oil prices. We need to watch the numbers that China is importing on crude oil very closely. Um, and, you know, they have a ton of wiggle room because they have massive stockpiles of crude oil. So they have a, China does have a considerable amount of wiggle room. If we see their imports drop massively one month, it doesn't, or one week or whatever, it does not mean, you know, that their demand has dropped in tandem with that. It just means that, you know, they might be offsetting it a little bit with their, with their stockpiles. And, and again, we don't have anybody who's researched China even a little bit understands that we do not have good clarity on Chinese data. So I would say some, the, the oil market may overreact, you know, in the near term, if we see stuff going on with, with, with Chinese teapot refineries or increased regulations. And right now, there's a lot, the Chinese government does seem, you know, hell bent on, on reining in a lot of control. I mean, this, uh, this after school tutoring, folks say, you know, they claim it, this is about, this is about just reining in, you know, too much capital in the system. And uh, usually after school tutoring, I mean, maybe it's, it's, it's after school tutoring and rich kids and, and the, the stock build up, but it, it's also probably education. It's also probably students getting education to, you know, a private education system. And I'm not sure China, you know, necessarily wants their students to be privately educated. Well, with that at the 5150 mark, I think we're going to end episode 23 there. Thank you. We have been uh, your hosts, Trisha Curtis and Ethan Bellamy. It's July 26th, 2021, and we'll be back with you next week. Absolutely. Thanks, Ethan. Bye. Thanks, Trisha. Bye-bye.